Tubby's gay. Oh, poop. Max Knight Ultra Spy. How can you not love a movie just from that title alone? That is a name that instantly grabs your attention, promises a lot of cheese, and presents so many expectations to deliver on. And I'm pleased to say, it delivers. Oh boy, does it deliver! Every awesome cliche, every over-the-top action sequence, and every flavor of cheesy writing, acting, and effects work is wrapped up in this glorious 80-minute package of what the hell did I just watch. Now technically, this isn't an Asylum movie. It wasn't officially produced or distributed through the Asylum, and unlike something like Sorority House Party, it wasn't added to their catalog later down the line. This movie was actually produced by Coot Hayes Productions, who made quite a few sci-fi fantasy TV movies and shows from the early to mid-2000s, and distributed by Paramount in 2000 for their UPN network, making this possibly the most mainstream film tied to the Asylum. But while they technically didn't make it, the movie was created and written by the Asylum heads David Michael Latt, David Wimwai, and Sherry Strain as well as newcomer Paul Bales, making his debut here before joining the Asylum as a writer, director, and producer. Roles he fills to this day. So yeah, I'm still counting this as an Asylum production, even despite how different it is from other Asylum movies. I'll get more into that later, but I've already held you back for too long, so let's cannonball straight into this pool of fondue. Max Knight, Grand Wizard of Digerati and Cyberdelic Legendary High Priest of Hackers, <laughs> is a computer genius and agent for hire, who spends most of his time breaking into tech corporations, stealing gigapets, yes really, and interleaking with his virtual assistant Claire, who in a totally appropriate can't be mistaken for anything else kind of way. On the other side of town, child prodigy Lindsay Daly is moments away from discovering a new element when she's kidnapped by evil Spice Girls. I should be above making that joke, but the movie isn't. Lindsay's been kidnapped. Oh. Evil Spice Girls. I hate them. She's taken to the girl's boss, who's the leader of a group of net regulation protesters called the Avatars, who want to tear down the barriers imposed on the internet by digitizing their minds and uploading their consciousness directly to the web. The machine needed to make this possible can't generate enough power, but Lindsay's new element will theoretically fix that issue, and she's convinced to help the cyber terrorists. Meanwhile, Lindsay's older sister Ricky tracks down Max Knight and convinces him to help find her sister. But while Max acts indestructible and cool as a cuke, he hides a secret that may reveal he's not as unstoppable as others may think. Can Max overcome his weakness and save the day? Would this have made a much better Spy Kids 3 than the one we actually got? How do I even describe what kind of movie this is? Okay, imagine if William Gibson was commissioned to write a screenplay. For the Disney Channel. This movie is full of Gibsonisms, as well as cyberpunk tropes in general. The oppressive megacorporations, the eccentric underground resistance, the exaggerated Japanese takeover, the cybernetic implants, the corporate espionage, the thin separation of AI and human sentience, the question about what makes us truly human and what we gain and lose by our over-reliance on technology, it's all here. But it's so bright, colorful, and watered down. So on top of the cyberpunk tropes, we get a lot of what out-of-touch corporations like to insert into their young adult media. Romanticized high school college life, softcore clubbing, mall shopping, child geniuses, a hot villain you want to bang despite his plan to destroy the world, a romance that springs right the hell out of nowhere between our leads, both with perfect physique and features, yet they're supposed to be the losers, and of course, a heaping helping of pop culture references that in no way date the movie nor contradict what year it's supposed to take place in. Well, they look like evil Spice Girls. Are the Teletubbies gay? Translating. I love Sailor Moon. You lamer Mulder and Scullies will still be practicing tail recursion. Somebody wants to meet you. Courtney Love? It's like Johnny Mnemonic if it was made by the same people who brought us Xenon Girl of the 21st century. The styles clash so horribly yet so wonderfully at the same time. Heck, the overall tone is one huge clash of demographics. 
By how I've described this movie, you'd assume this is something that could air on Nickelodeon in between Jimmy Neutron and Danny Phantom. An innocent live action made for TV production meant to keep your kids quiet for two hours. But it's not! For all its sanitized imagery, bright colors, and simplified story elements you'd normally see in a PG-rated flick, there's a lot of adult language and innuendo. Okay, not to extreme levels, not like something you'd see on Showtime, but still a lot of profanity that doesn't match the tone I think the movie's going for. Plus, the main villain clearly has the hots for Lindsay. Which, seeing as how she's 16 and he looks like he's in his late 20s... Yeah. But I'm sure this movie's just gonna leave it at suggestion and he's not gonna do anything squicky. <laughs> hey. Why don't you have a seat there and uh, get comfortable for that? And I wasn't kidding earlier, Max Knight makes it no secret he wants to f his computer. And vice versa. I'm in position. Are you ready for penetration? Later, Claire, I'm working. Please insert your adapter into my energy core. No music? You look bigger. Have you been working out? I gotta change that program. It's so out of place, it makes the movie even more bonkers. What is the focus? Who was this movie made for? Was their first draft dismissed as being too kid-friendly, so they tossed some swear words and sex into the script to make it appeal to a wider audience? That doesn't make it more adult. If anything, it, now it's more juvenile. And ironically, it also becomes more watchable. It flip-flops back and forth between being for adults and for kids so often, it's hilarious to watch. In the same way, Mickey Mouse suddenly dropping an F-bomb would make that scene an absolute treasure. It's so confused about its audience's taste that it's like it's a large plate of grape jelly and mustard sandwiches. And you can just sit back and laugh as it desperately tries to find someone willing to take a bite. Story-wise, there's not much to point out or complain about. It has a plot, but a very linear, no twists or frills type of plot. Which is pretty rare in a post-Sixth Sense world, where every movie for the last two decades has to have some surprise third act that changes everything. It's your standard evil villain wants to destroy the world using a powerful MacGuffin, so this action hero and his girlfriend have to fight their way to his evil lair and stop him. By the time the villain's shown up at the 20 minute mark, you've figured out almost everything that will happen in this movie. And that's not a bad thing. As long as they're having fun making it, a movie with an A to B structure can be just as enjoyable as any game-changing, twist-riddled, surprise villain plot. And when said movie involves a one-man heist through a Japanese corporation to lift a gigapet, a chase between a geek girl on a skateboard and roller skating mall rats, virtual reality call waiting, fully mental internet browsing, a car chase with brat stalls on motorcycles, a shootout in the kitchen section of a mall, and an undercover FBI agent getting his brain transplanted into a floppy disk, well, you just have the greatest movie ever made! No comparison! No cyber dolphins, but eh, we can't have everything. And because it's made in the early days of network browsing, we of course get faux geeks speak about the internet, clearly written by 35 year olds who have no clue what they're talking about. It uses a gallium arsenide chip and holographic storage, seven terabytes of memory. It's a PSTN slash PCMCIA card. Of course it is. Check this out, guys. This is insanely great. It's got a 28.8 BPS modem. Was that the new Pentium 3? Display? Active Matrix, man. A million psychedelic colors. I'm not getting a list, Ben. Give me a reference, bro. Okay, I'm tracking current to the main system, but I can't keep the virus out for long. If the processor freezes, we'll lose right, it. Lock the system code and derez the Z buffers. It's not in the hyperdrive. I'm losing the codex. Come on! Wait. If we sent a low-level ionic pulse, it might reset the coil and trigger the cloaking device. Okay, I'm listing the D file. Yes. Press the digitizer. Oh, I'm glad we don't get internet movies made by old men anymore. And in case you were worried they forgot to include futuristic slang they figured everybody would be saying in 20 years, they covered that base too. Girlful. Epic. Janky. Duty. Crockish. Grand Wizard of Digerati. Master of Black Art. Lord High Doyen of Hack. It's for Buku Emergencito only. She gifted. Crunky. Mathematical! Smeg pot! See the subpoena! Drop well as peak. Damn. Disable flame mode. We gweep this F2F on Veronica. My girl doesn't grok hackish. She's 4.2, but boinky smurf. Boinky? Mo? Ag, ag. Yeah, okay, Boomer. I don't mean to sound like a delicate snowflake, but you're a total SJW when you throw shade with lingo like that. I mean, it's hell embarrassing, lol. So stick to hanging out with your MILFs and their tight mom jeans until you get some swagger and, oh yeah, GTFO. Um, 
hashtag it's okay to be a bay. And yet, in the same vein as Demolition Man, The Truman Show, and Modern Times, this is a movie with themes that have become more relevant in today's social climate. The Avatars are an extremist group protesting the many, many restrictions the FCC has imposed on the web. Their leader gives a speech to his followers about how the network started as a free exchange of information where everyone was equal, until people in power realized they couldn't control the spread of ideas and creativity, so they imposed various censorship programs on public communication and divided sections of the net among idiots with money who, in his own words, don't even know how to program a VCR. The group just wants a world where they're free to surf and act Access without having to pay through the nose for basic information or be told what they can or can't look at or upload. Okay, they want to achieve this by transferring their brains directly to the World Wide Web and nuking the rest of humanity so they can surf without fear of deletion, but you can see where they're coming from. And in today's post-net neutrality world, where communications corporations are free to throttle and even sell data, large sites have upped their decency restrictions for created content, and any bum with net access can block, delete, or at least steal profit from content they don't have to prove belongs to them, it wouldn't surprise me if similar groups like this actually exist. Or even that a similar plan might actually happen. Man, who knew the writers behind Super Croc, Killers 2, and Way of the Vampire were prophets of our time? and that this was a more accurate apocalypse movie than their literal apocalypse movies. But despite that dourness, we are still dealing with an intentionally cheesy action film, and it's hard to focus on the prophetic themes when there's such a crazy cast of characters. Starting with Max Knight, jeez, how do I even describe this guy? Okay, imagine if in Spider-Man 3, if Peter Parker shed the symbiote but still kept his bad boy persona, and then at some point somehow pulled off the fly-like transportation accident with Matthew Broderick. You would get the most try-hard poser nerd trying to be cool that you could imagine. It's an absolute delight to watch this guy trying to look like a badass and pulling it off as effectively as Eddie Dezine emulating Bruce Campbell. Oh, that's not to say he's not a badass. He lives up to his grand digital rigidry or whatever with tech and moves anyone would be jealous of. But with that leather jacket, beard stubble, and clueless expression permanently pasted onto his face, this is a man that oozes insecurity from every pore, which he probably wipes off and slicks back his hair with. It doesn't help that he speaks in a permanently nasally whine that sounds like Tobey Maguire crossed with Steve Buscemi. Or me. Claire? We have a new objective to get that girl. We can do this the easy way or the <laughs> really uncomfortable way. There's a robe in the bathroom over there in case you're um, cold or whatever. What can I say, Claire? You make me hot. He's also what the hacker community would consider a poser. As instead of building his equipment, he just bought it all from a distributor. Some of it's secondhand and outdated. There's even a running gag where he tries to contact tech support about his constantly malfunctioning cloaking device. Which, hey, speaking of themes relevant to today. Hello. Hi, yeah, I'm having trouble you with my... the automated technical support line for Spycorp International. You're kidding me. We're sorry. Automated technical support is not available for the product you've specified. Please contact your authorized service representative during regular business hours. Oh, and the weakness his character has that he's hesitant to reveal to his love interest? He has an artificial heart that he needs to charge every so often. And that adds nothing to anything other than a quick fake out at the end, and some more cybersex talk. 20 minutes, it only takes 5 minutes with Claire. It's also worth noting that the title is a lie. At no point does Max attempt anything spy-like or conduct any espionage to gain information. The closest we get is the opening sequence, but even there he makes no effort to hide his identity or his presence, and his goal is to steal a top-secret Gigapet, which, believe it or not, is a plot point. This guy's as much of a secret agent as Indiana Jones is an archaeologist. But really, who cares about any of that? Anyone who can take down two heavily armed security guards and deliver a cool zinger afterwards can call himself King of the Lumberjacks for all I dare to challenge. Gotta fly. And then there's Ricky, and she's... there? Yeah, there's really not much to this character. She's the sister of the girl who was kidnapped by the Avatars, and she hires Max Knight to track her down. But besides those two attributes, I don't think she contributes a single thing to this movie. She's just an additional damsel in distress who's there to make Max Knight look smart and that he has to save from tripping over her own shoelaces every five minutes. 
She's also supposed to be his love interest, in a very tepid romantic subplot that's comprised almost entirely of her meeting Max and, 30 minutes later, the making out. And keep in mind, their first meeting was comprised of her smashing a laptop over his head and him accidentally burning down her house. If that doesn't instantly turn you on, I don't know what will. Afterwards, she gets kidnapped and... Yeah, that's it. I'd say she's Willie Scott from Temple of Doom, but even Willie pulled a lever to save Jones at one point. The only reason she's around is so they can make a running gag about her and Max's virtual assistant Claire being played by the same actor. I'm Max Knight's personal assistant. Have we met? Claire? Yes, Max. Is that you? It's time to meet your three-dimensional twin. And if you think this is so Max will end up with the woman he loves and bang her for real, the ending fixes that little detail, so no, there's no reason for Ricky to tag along. Except to demonstrate her on-again, off-again Australian accent. Well, how am I supposed to get in contact with him? There isn't a phone number on this card. <laughs> oh my god. I've never hired an ultra spy before. How much do you cost? Actually, to be fair, I do like the dynamics between Max and Claire. That Max has designed her to be the perfect woman for him, and that she wishes there was some way for them to be together in the same plane of reality. Okay, it's creepy if you overthink it, but I buy the relationship between Max and Claire far more than the other woman. In fact, why couldn't they just have Claire be the tag-along? Have her travel in a tiny PC or a wristwatch that Max wears, something that Max can use to bypass passwords and other lockouts. Take someone along that actually has a use. Then, when Max suffers a near heart attack, they can show their vulnerable sides, with Max having to shed his tough guy persona and Claire regretting being unable to help Max in his time of need. That would make that scene ten times more effective, and add more meaning to later when they can finally exist in the same space. You know, instead of a spontaneous makeout with Rachel, uh, I mean, Roberta, uh, Rose, Roxy, Ruby, Riley, Ricky, Ricky, that's it, Ricky. Yeah, what an impact she leaves. The other characters are also just there. Lindsay's just there, this nerdy guy who's friends with Ricky and Lindsay is just there, and the evil Spice Girls are just there. They fill their roles and push the plot in the direction it needs to go, and yeah, that's it. I don't even remember their names, and according to the credits, half of them don't even have a name. So besides Max Knight, no other character really stands out or has a distinctive personality. With the obvious exception of our villain, Zachary Khan. This is a human persona of a cartoon character if there ever was one. From his entrance riding in on a crane-supported eyeball cage, holding a cane with a fist on the end, looking like that pop star from Xenon, you can instantly tell there will be no subtlety to this performance. And yeah, you'd be right. If anything, he just gets wackier from there. He shoots lasers from his hand one thing, he flies around in his little ball more than the Duke with the jetpack in Dune, he sexually harasses his henchwomen and underage girls, okay you, he dresses like a member of NSYNC with a personality, and he somehow retains enough dignity to amass a legion of followers while making one-liners and stretchy faces that would give Jim Carrey's Riddler a run for his money. Oops. I forgot. We can't run the neural vacuum when the AC's on. Now I know what you're thinking. Oh sure, he's over the top, but he wouldn't introduce his hostages like a game show announcer, then order a choreographed dance number while playing That's the Way I Like It, would he? Oh ye of little faith. Oh, but wait, there's more! Our first contestant, our brain-sucking human beta tester! Oh, yes. Even when he's digitized himself, become Max Headroom if he joined the band Lit, and meets his end by his own virus, he has not yet begun to ham. <laughs> it's a close call whether Max or Zack is more entertaining, but by guy do they both make it hard to decide. So I won't. Cast-wise, there's not a lot to go over. Title character Max Knight is played by Michael Landis. I'm not familiar with his work, but he's apparently an action hero legend, with over 80 movies and shows to his name and a career that continues to this day. Oh, but he was Jimmy Olsen in Lois and Clark, had recurring roles in The Wonder Years, Fresh Prince, and a bunch of other stuff, and was in Lakeview Terrence and Final Destination 2, both of which I have no plans to see. Oh, and recently he was in a miniseries called Hooten and the Lady, which I've never heard of, but I now have to watch based on the title alone. The rest of the cast is featured in other Coot Hayes productions. 
yeah, what are the odds? Some of them are still active, but not in anything that I recognize, so I got nothing. This is the first Asylum movie in a while where none of the cast appeared in any further Asylum productions. Which makes sense, since like I said, this isn't actually an Asylum movie. But it's interesting that, with as many productions either created or distributed by the Asylum that exist, not one of these actors even had a role as an extra in some of them. Well, that needs to be remedied. Michael Landis in the Asylum's knockoff of the upcoming He-Man movie, please! Technically speaking, this is probably the most professional movie with Asylum ties. Camera, lighting, color balance, stunts, all are professionally done, giving the impression that I'm watching, well, a professional movie. It's interesting to see an Asylum flick with a budget, and I can guarantee this is the best looking movie we'll see throughout their catalog. We get some very impressively built sets that really help to give the movie a style and make things seem bigger than the backlot most of the movie was probably shot on. I love the contrast they give, from the bleached white sterile high-tech layout of Max Knight's apartment, to the dark and grungy alleyways hiding in illegal neck clubs, to the somewhat half and half warehouse that Zack and his avatars hide out in. Just by looking at the background, you immediately know where you are, what people live here, and what kind of style this movie is going for. Sure, it's not Star Wars level set design, but considering how many Asylum movies I've seen that look like they take place solely in an abandoned warehouse, it might as well be. We also get a funky, upbeat soundtrack full of techno rave music that the 90s and 2000s thought we would all be listening to by now. Which I would rather be listening to instead of the latest Drake track. We do get a couple annoying 2000s camera tricks, especially the fast zoom in and out, but they're not utilized too often and I can forgive it for not knowing any better. But the biggest wow for this movie are the effects. This movie relies on a good amount of CGI and, unlike other movies featured here, they know how to use it. In the intro alone, Max warps open a window, sends out probes to scout the area, uses his glasses to follow blueprints for the building, dodges charged ion blasts, projects the face of the company's CEO to bypass facial recognition, and takes down guards with a cloaking device. Okay, most of it is obviously dated, and I'm pretty sure you can find many of these now as stock templates in any modern editing program, but for TV movies of the time, these are pretty impressive. They're cheesy, but they match the tone of the movie, and some of them, like this face projection, hold up better than even more recent Asylum movies. By comparison, this is an Asylum movie released only a few months ago, and... Yeah, just marvel at the Star Trek Voyager Stargate SG-1 effects and designs. You know, for a studio so reliant on CGI, the Asylum doesn't exactly raise the bar. Or bother taking a grab at it. But despite how incredible this movie's been so far, nothing compares to the ending. One that takes all the elements that made this movie so cheesy and incredible, and squeezes them all into one spectacular 10 minute finale. One I don't know how much I can talk about. Oh, not because of spoilers, like I said, this movie has nothing to hide, but just because of how much awesome is crammed into these last few minutes. Zack digitizes himself, starts a countdown to destroy humanity, and Max has to go in and stop Zack to save the world. And thus begins an epic showdown between two massive intellects and egos across cyberspace itself, stopping in the porn section, the untapped reaches of the web, and even the original Half-Life game. I am so not kidding. Most of the final battle is a machinima animation taking place in one of the greatest FPS games ever made. Yeah, you thought Wreck-It Ralph was the greatest video game crossover movie ever made? Pfft, low polygon count Max Knight spits on that. And that's just a sample of this gloriously ludicrous ending that I can't do justice trying to summarize. You'll just have to see the insanity for yourself. If I haven't made it clear by now, I friggin' love this movie. Sure, the plot's nothing new, the characters can be a bore, and it doesn't know who its audience is, but what it lacks in story, it makes up for in sheer craziness. From the clashing styles, the charmingly dated effects, to the overacting, to even the underacting, this is one of the most unrepentantly goofy movies I've ever seen. It's something I wish we saw more from from the Asylum. A fun movie with cartoonish characters and effects that doesn't want to be taken seriously. It just wants to entertain, and slip in a few subtle subtexts while doing so. If you're looking for a purely fun, hilariously dated hacker flick that makes the Matrix look subtle, I can't recommend this movie highly enough. And if you're interested, you can grab your own copy for the low price of... You can watch it on YouTube. 
Sit back, turn it on, and get turbo crockish, my cyberdelic avatars. Well, that was fun, checking in with another studio that just so happens to have ties to the asylum. But can the asylum keep the ball rolling with its own next production? Check back next time and we'll find out together. Hey there everyone, thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon and help me create even more content like this. It's only a dollar to get early access to my videos, and only five dollars gets you a credit at the end of each of those videos, with higher tiers offering these and even more perks. And as you help me reach certain goals, I have super special content lined up for all of you. Head on over and check out my Patreon today, and I'll see you next time.